Hello, everyone. It's one o'clock Eastern. Um, so let's get started so we can use all the precious minutes that we have together. Welcome to today's webinar on Meeting the Moment, Strategies for Contributing to a Broad Conversation on Genetics and Society. This is the third joint webinar organized by the Genetic Society of America and the Personal Genetics Education, Education Project, or PGED for short. My name is Marnie Gelbart. I'm the Director of Programs at PGED, where we're operating out of the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's session on discussing reproductive genetics. Um, we will be talking about sensitive topics that many find deeply personal and challenging. So we ask everyone to be respectful and kind with the presenters and other participants. GSA has a code of conduct for all of its online events. The link is on the slide here. I don't anticipate that we'll have any issues today, um, but GSA staff will remove anyone who is disrupting the workshop. We will be recording PG Ed's presentation so we can share it with people who couldn't be here today. Um, we take people's privacy very seriously. And so our intention is to record only the presenters, not any of the participants. But if by chance um, the participants are in the recording, um, that piece will be edited out before we share the video online. Okay. So um, the goal of this session is to share tools that PG Ed has developed to engage people in conversations about genetic testing as it intersects with reproduction and to share the discussion strategies that we've used um, to create a space where people can both learn, um, but also share their experiences and views. Uh, I'm joined today by three of my colleagues at PG Ed, Nadine Vincentin, Dana Waring, and Robin Bowman. Um, and everything that we'll be presenting builds on the work of our former team members and on the lessons that PG Ed has learned over the past 15 years from the people who have been kind enough to share their time with us to have a conversation about genetics. So here's an outline for today's session. For the next hour until 2 p.m. Eastern, we'll be using a standard webinar format. We'll hear a presentation from Nadine and Dana, and then we'll reserve about the last 10 minutes for Q&A. We ask you to keep your microphone muted. I see we have over 100 people here. Um, and please use the chat box for questions and comments throughout the hour. Robin is going to be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so um, we have reserved an additional 30 minutes for an after party, so to speak. Um, this was going to be a time for informal conversation with the PG Ed team. We found in our last webinar that several people wanted to stay and chat or just listen in. And so this will happen from 2 to 2.30 Eastern time. Um, while we know that some people come to webinars to listen and learn, we've also heard that um, some of you would like to have spaces for small group discussions. And Nadine will be sharing some ways that PG Ed and GSA have planned to keep the conversation going um, beyond this session. Um, and we welcome your feedback all the time on how our programming can help to meet your needs. Okay, so with that in mind, let's get started. And I'm just dealing with my technology. Um, okay, so um, today we're talking about reproductive genetics because having children or trying to have children is a common moment when genetic tools might enter a person's life. So many people get carrier testing when they're pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant. As a person of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, this was the moment that genetics first got personal for me. Um, when my doctor told me they'd need to draw 15 vials of blood. Even all the years I spent doing my PhD, my four years in my postdoc, the personal aspect of genetics hit home for me in a really new way in that moment. Many people were stunned this week to learn about a company that's marketing genetic tests before a person becomes pregnant using polygenic risk scores for traits such as schizophrenia where the genetics is far for, from understood. For people who use donors to have children, should they expect that a sperm bank will genetically screen their donors? 
new gen generations of non-invasive prenatal tests are giving more people a window into the genetic makeup of the fetus they are carrying. How are people going to grapple with the availability of this data? For decades, um, people have been using genetic screening to avoid passing on serious illness to their children. But given the cost of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, many are concerned about the ways that genetic tools are exacerbating disparities. And the inequities are not only issues of access. With the advent of CRISPR comes the possibility of editing the germline and concerns for a new eugenics. The last example I'll share here um, is, is how technologies keep on moving. In vitro, in vitro gametogenesis is a technique that could make it possible to derive egg and sperm from skin cells, which might one day give same-sex couples the chance to have a child that they are both biologically connected with. So people are grappling with these issues today, making decisions for their families, wondering if they will have access, looking to the future. Some are pinning their hopes on therapies that could help their family. Some are fearful of where all this might leave. And for many of us, it's a combination of hope and fear at the same time. So we're all here today as a genetics community because we recognize that we have a responsibility, because we deeply hope that the science coming out of our labs will help people, will be used equitably and safely, because we are humbled that we do not have all the answers. And as we aspire to meet this moment, what is the path forward? Well, for work of this magnitude, surely there is no single answer. Um, and we've heard from some of you since we launched this initiative with GSA about your personal missions for meeting this moment. Some of you are here to learn about PG Ed's approach, which is centered on education and dialogue that's inclusive of as many people as possible. We know that some of you are here because you're committed to preparing the next generation of scientists in your undergrad advanced biology courses um, and in your labs. Some are focused on increasing representation in research. So historically marginalized peoples are included as both research participants and also as researchers who have a seat at the table where decisions are made and power to direct what happens next. Some are focused on advocacy and activism to affect political change. And some of you here might not really be sure what your path is, but you're hungry to move beyond talk and find ways to take action. Um, and so we're really grateful that you're all here. So when I, um, in my travels, no matter where I am, I always find that I'm learning something meaningful, even if it is not what I went looking for in the first place. So for whatever brought you here today, I believe that PGA does have something valuable to offer you um, as we share our approach for engaging people on engaging with people on genetics, and that much of what we've done can be adapted and tailored as needed. So in our work, we recognize that many people are already thinking about genetics, have experience with genetics, they have nuanced opinions and many questions. And at the same time, I think all of us here can agree that most people are not lining up for miles to have a conversation about genetics. There are many reasons for that. And our genetics community with the history of our field, the priorities that are driving our endeavors, um, the way we've been trained to communicate, all of these things have had a hand in that. And so much of our focus at PG Ed is thinking, where do we begin? How do we start the conversation? especially with people from communities that scientists have traditionally failed to engage. So over the past 15 years, PG Ed's developed an approach that we found, found highly effective for meeting people where they are, whether they're in classrooms, community spaces, places of worship or government offices, at home watching TV, in a movie theater or online. And the crux of the approach is one that surely surprised me when I first started at PG Ed, is to talk about genetics in an accurate and nuanced way, but also in an accessible way that's centered on people, where mo most of the nuts and bolts of the science have been stripped away and without any hint of advocating for or against the use of genetics. So as we share this approach with you, 
in the context of reproductive genetics. I just want to acknowledge that the way PGED conducts these types of conversations might seem pretty unusual given our norms of science communication. But a lot of what works for PGED is actually because of the attention that we play to the social and emotional context of our communication. So if this feels different from what you are used to, um, I hope you will bear with us, lean in and keep listening. I really love this quote from esteemed poet, author and civil rights activist, Maya Angelou. Um, so much so that actually I've posted it on the wall above my computer because I think it embodies what PG Ed strives for. So in Dr. Angelou's words, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Of course, we want people to retain as much information that we share as possible, but there's a limit to how much we can share in any five minute or one hour interaction. But if we are able to make a personal connection, we've seen on numerous occasions how people remember that genetics is something that they want to pay attention to and that they know people they can reach out to and ask questions of. The approach that our team see seeks to share with you today is not a co cookie cutter. Lather, rinse, repeat, a 10 step protocol that is the same every time. Instead, I like to think of it as a recipe that takes on a life of its own, depending on who's making it, pulling in different ingredients, making it, make it, making it their own. So in, in that spirit, today's presentation draws from a handful of the resources that PG Ed has created that are related to reproductive genetics. You can download all of these from our website we have the link to our lesson plan page here um, and Robin if you have a chance please pop the link in the chat and um, with that I will thank you for being here and I will turn things over to Nadine. Oh thanks Marnie. Get myself situated here. Yes. Technology. Oh you the think technology. you think after a year this would be <laughs> smooth sailing but <laughs> Let's see. So that should hopefully be my presentation ready to go. I'll set myself a timer to make sure I don't ramble on for too long. So thanks everybody for joining us today. So my part of today's conversation is really kind of talking about some of the strategies that we as a team use in having these conversations. Um, and I'm using our lesson on reproductive genetic testing kind of as a as a tool today, so I'm not going to go into the lesson in detail, but more to kind of display and show you some of the strategies and tips and tricks that we use as we're having these uh, conversations with people. And so the first strategy I wanted to share is something that you might have heard of as classroom agreements, um, community agreements, teachers, especially with younger kids, often call them ground rules. Again, like Marty said, it's not cookie cutter, use whatever name you feel is applicable to the, to the people you're meeting with. But really the idea is to create what we know as like a brave space, um, a space that's intentionally shaped by and inclusive of all identities and social groups and encourages equitable participation, right? We really want to have a conversation with people, a dialogue, and to have a dialogue in and create a space that people feel comfortable to talk in, setting some agreements at the start, um, the picture is actually from a teacher workshop we did where we asked teachers, this was pre-COVID, so it was in person, <laughs> where we asked teachers like, what are some agreements we would want to have together? So that's, um, you can set it up like that, like communally come up with these agreements. You can kind of assign them yourself, whatever way you feel works for you. And just some examples of this, my presentation wants to, there we go. Sample agreements that we've often used and often kind of naturally come up are speak from your own experience, realize the impact of your words and it can be different than what you intend them uh, to be and own the impact that your words might have. Listen to understand, not to respond. The focus should be on learning, not on debating. You don't have to agree with each other, but you must be civil, critique ideas, not people. It's okay to change your mind. This for me personally is always a big one to emphasize and I'll get back to it later. Share the floor, pass the mic, step up, step back, right? Give each other the space, make sure that as many voices are here in the time that you have with each other. 
and challenged by choice, each individual can choose if or when they want to participate. And so this is something that, like I said, we've done teacher workshop, we set this up at the start, uh, Marnie kind of did some something similar at the start today, right, what she kind of said, uh, the, she introduced the code of conduct from GSA, which is another way of, of kind of um, communicating the same thing. Um, I will say for those of you who are teachers, educators who might be with classrooms for an extended period of time, a semester course, a year long, I would strongly advise to set this up at the start. Don't only do this when you feel we're going to have a quote unquote difficult conversation today, but just get students used to this and practice this throughout your time together. So my next slide here is actually, this is the very first slide of our lesson on reproductive genetic, reproductive genetic testing. It's discussion questions. Like Marnie already said, we are interested in having a dialogue with people. So we want to start with the dialogue. We want to start inviting people to, to share their opinions. Um, again, I'm not going to go into these specific questions right now, but it's really to kind of demonstrate the tools that we have. Actually, I think almost every single one of our lesson has some form of discussion questions or what we like to call a do now at the very start to kind of foster that communication, start the dialogue, get people talking. And part of that is also when you think about, you know, what might be some barriers that inhibit people from joining the conversation. And one of them could be that if I show up in a classroom or a community space as, you know, working at Harvard, people might introduce me as a doctor having a PhD, that can be intimidating to a lot of people to then just speak up. And I want to, from the start, try and lower those barriers as much as possible and say, no, you have very valid opinions, a very valid voice in this conversation, and let's start there. And I wanna hear that voice. I'm not here to, um, you know, talk at you, let's talk together. And so this is why we use these tools from the very start of the conversation to, to foster a dialogue and hopefully get uh, as many people engaged as possible. And so like I said, the next couple of slides are directly from our lesson on reproductive genetics. I'm not gonna go into them in detail. Um, the website was shared earlier. You can download the materials if you're interested in learning more. But this lesson, as Marnie mentioned, it's, it's, it's really where when we're talking about genetics coming into people's lives, this is very often it. This is the first time for a lot of people they meet genetics is when they're trying to have kids. And so uh, even though, like Marnie said, a lot of our lessons are not about the nuts and bolts of the science, but more like how the science meets society, we do spend some time in this lesson going through some of these technologies because they are so directly into people's lives, right? We're talking about, for example, amniocentesis, CVS. Uh, we talk about non-invasive um, Prenatal testing, NIPT, what is it? How does it work? I mean, especially this one for me was always like, when you think about it, NIPT uh, is you take a blood sample from a pregnant person to learn about traits of the fetus. Me as a trained geneticist, I'm always, you know, and the fact that I know about these things, I always feel relieved of like, well, if I, you know, get pregnant at some point and I'm in this doctor's office, I understand why they're drawing my blood. I've already had a chance to think about it, right? To think about, do I want this test? What is it? because it can have a major impact on your life to receive these results. Then I think about like, what if you've never heard about this? And, and sure, a, a doctor will probably try and explain it to you before you know, taking the test, but in that office, as a sample of your blood is taken, that's not obviously linked to the fetus, right? If you think of an amniocentesis or CVS, they're probably working towards the belly, right? Where your pregnancy is. This is a sample from your arm. You know, this is why we feel it's so important to. To, to talk about these things even you know in classrooms so people are prepared and have thought about some of these things um, before they uh, are sitting in a doctor's office. Now another thing I wanted to point out in this slide um, is actually the language we're using. So PGED in this slide and in our work um, uses the term pregnant person in recognition that not everyone who enters pregnancy would become a mother for example in the case of surrogacy or necessarily identifies as a woman. Now, for a lot of you, the fact that I said pregnant person earlier when I was talking about NPT might have not really registered. However, for some people in this crowd who might, you know, have experienced surrogacy or don't identify as a, as a woman having been pregnant, like this kind of language can make a huge difference and is another way to lower barriers, right? They don't feel excluded in that moment if I would have said uh, mother or woman that might exclude certain people. We're trying to be inclusive there. And try is really the key word, like, you know, from somebody 
like another example for me has always been like, I worked as a yeast geneticist for a long part of my academic career. The word mutation was probably a word I use every day in my life, making strains, dealing with all the different permutations. But having now been working with PGET for about two years, I still am getting used to the fact that, for example, mutation has, as a word has negative connotation to a lot of people. If you think about, for example, the X-Men movies, right? They're all mutants. They're often referred to as freaks in those movies by the general public in the movie. Like, it has a lot of negative connotations. And so we and many people will use the word <clears throat> variant or variation to talk about changes in DNA rather than mutation. But I catch myself often slipping back into that. And probably if you go through our lesson materials with a toothpick, I'm sure you'll find moments where we have not updated that language yet. So, it's really for me to say like, for a lot of you like communicating this way or doing this type of work might be very new and seem intimidating. And it is, I'm not gonna lie. I made that switch to a very different way of communicating, but very often the fact that you show that you're trying and you're trying is really what a lot of people are, are looking for. And so other methods we talk about, again, that are in people's lives, things like IVF, uh, PGD, Prenatal genetic testing is kind of linked to that, right? Where you can test embryos and then decide which one, um, if any, to implant. And I want to kind of pause on this slide, which is a slide that gets a lot of different reactions. It's both, for some people, awe-inspiring. The fact that we can do PGD, um, especially for families who might have had certain traits in their family that they hope to not pass on to their kids, this is the answer to them. This is like a health kind of procedure that they would love to take advantage of. For other people, seeing this image is horrifying, right? The idea that we can uh, make like what they might think of to some extent designer babies are terms that are thrown around, playing God, right? That we make these decisions. And so recognizing that like Marnie, uh, did in the introduction today, like kind of the moral status of the embryo in the US and I'm sure internationally is a, a topic that people have very different opinions on for a variety of reasons. And that's something that we're going to go into the second half of this presentation. But I just want to pause it to kind of acknowledge that, um, that fact. And another thing to think about here is as well, like I'm introducing all these technologies that can, you know, seem promising for a lot of people, but even for people that might feel they're promising, might want to have used them, they don't have access to them. And I think that's something also important to acknowledge is like, you know, this time we talk about reproductive genetic testing technologies, we might have other lessons where we talk about, you know, genome sequencing, CRISPR technologies that can all be very exciting, but I think it's always important to recognize that to the people that you're talking to, these technologies might not be accessible for a variety of reasons. And we'll see um, some details on that later. And so, so far I've kind of introduced different technologies. It's the same what we would do when we meet with people. But again, what we're interested in is where these technologies, these genetic technologies come into society. And so this is kind of where the presentation switches tone and looks more towards that with the story of the Nash family, um, which again, as a side note, storytelling is always the best way to get people engaged, to get people interested and for people's brains to stick, for the information to stick, right? A list of facts, generally a bit less effective than stories. So just a side note, but it's always people get very excited to, to hear about kind of real life stories. And this is one of them. So this is a Nash family. Uh, in the picture, you see Molly, the girl with the pink cap on her head. So she suffered from a, a deadly disorder called Fanconi anemia. And she needed a stem cell transfer to be able to treat that. Um, and her parents were planning on having a second child and decided to do PGD, first of all, to ensure that their second child would not have Fanconi anemia like Molly did. But in addition to that, they also decided to select for an embryo that would be a, um, a donor match for Molly to be able to give Molly those stem cells that she needs for her treatment. And so here in the picture, you can see Adam, the little sleeping baby here, um, who was born, having been selected for these traits and was able to provide Molly with the stem cells that she needed. And now when this story came out, like this family was one of the first families to publicly come out with this story and, and using this type of technology. 
it was met with a wide array of responses from people being very excited, very supportive, you know, very inspired by this story to people like this family received a lot of hate for the decisions they made, right? Again, this idea of like, you were playing God, um, concerns about um, Adam's well-being, a whole range of, of opinions as these technologies meet our society. And so to kind of look at this in more detail, and the presentation itself does that, but like I said, we try and always, you know, hear people's voices, the people that we're in the room with, or in this time, in our virtual room with together. And so this is actually what you're seeing on the slide here is an anonymous polling exercise that is actually part of this lesson. And this is a time where, oh, if I can get things to show up, there we go. Zoom has, has its advantages where anonymous polling is a lot easier than when you do this in person in a classroom, but our lesson has some tips and tricks if you do this in person. But today we're gonna to do this here as a poll, which hopefully should have shown up on your screen. So I encourage you to answer this as I'm talking. So the idea of this, of this kind of anonymous polling is really to get to people's thoughts on like, what, what do we think embryo testing should be used for? And there's five different scenarios here that you're asked to uh, respond to. Now, because we recognize, like I said before, that this is a very, you know, the moral stance of the embryo is a, is an, it can be an intense discussion. People opinions vary widely. This is why we want to do this anonymous, to really give people the comfort to speak up um, about their thoughts of it without having to, in a way, maybe they might feel like they're exposing themselves and put this in quotation marks, right? This idea of like, we want to hear people's voices and we're giving people a chance to speak up um, and to do so. And also from the other side, like we all live in bubbles. That's just the reality of life. Um, and so a lot of people might think like, oh, I think everybody thinks like me. Right? That's a very common, we all do this, natural thing to do. So what we hope to achieve with, with exercises like this is that they can see the variety of opinions that are out there when they're not filtered by, oh, you know, I can't say this here or I can't do that. And so I see a majority of you while I've been chatting have answered. So let's see. I'm going to give you five seconds for those of you who are wrapping up. Let's see this last minute ones. Oh, counters. So let, let's see how we, as a community here today, or the 92 of you that have voted, are thinking about these different topics. So, wow, the first one got 100%. That's not usual. <laughs> um, so should people be allowed to test embryos for painful, deadly diseases that develop within the first three years of life? So we seem to have in this community of people that voted today, 100% there. The next one, should people be allowed to test for deadly disease that develop in young adulthood? So here we see 96% of people say yes, 4% no. Should people be allowed to test when it's when we're dealing with disease that develop later in life? So we're here, we use the age of 75 as a cutoff. We have a exact 50-50 split <laughs> of uh, yes versus no. Then as my cursor wants to we go, what about if they have <clears throat> they're not necessarily deadly diseases, but can have a major impact on the family. And we see about close to 90% of people agree, 12% say no. And what about choosing the sex of your child? And here we see almost a split of the previous result or a flip of the previous result with a now about 80% saying no, 20% of people agree for this. So this is something you, again, could do in your classroom. You can have further conversations if you wanted to. Obviously, the, the, the aim is to have this anonymous, so you have to kind of see um, <clears throat> what the group, how the group feels about this. Let me close everything there. I'm gonna take a sip of tea before my voice completely. <clears throat> there we go. And so the next slide here, again, we're now switching back to what's actually in the presentation. This is a study that was done in 2013, published in 2015, that kind of inspired our anonymous polling exercise. Um, this is where they asked the US public, over a thousand people, their opinions on, it's very similar questions, right? We're dealing here with, hopefully you can see my cursor here, with fatal disease on the, all the way on the left to things like late onset disease, personality trees, sexual orientation. And so we, we show this because, you know, luckily today, our, we're with a relatively big crowd, so we can see a varied 
uh, opinions on these different things. But let's imagine you have a very small classroom um, where you feel this polling exercise might not work the way you like, or like it, it, it's not going to show a very very kind of response. This is just another piece of information where I could see like, okay, we looked at it in our classroom, we looked at it in our community today, we looked at it here online. Let's see how, if we look at a thousand people within the US uh, opinions, uh, what they look like. So we can definitely see trends here, right? Of like, so the dark blue here uh, might be a bit tricky to read, but the dark blue here is the agree. And then the red is disagree. The light blue are people that selected neither. So I think that was like, you are kind of in between agree, disagree. So definitely trends of like fatal diseases, people say in early childhood, mostly agree. This is where we hit, hit our 100% here. And then um, here's sex selection. We get to like a 50% disagree to like these categories of sexual orientation, personalities, physical characteristics. We now have about a 60% disagree. So one thing I would, for example, point out if I was, and now today we're also in classrooms is like even though there's trends and there's definitely majority groups for almost all of these there are still significant amounts of people that have an opposite opinion right even with like in this case the fatal disease is checking embryos there there are 10 percent that are disagreeing with it and almost 70 percent that are kind of in between things and also on the other side of the spectrum when we look at something like personality traits even though 50 to 51 percent says i disagree with it there's definitely a significant portion that says either agree or kind of in the middle. So again, to highlight that there are varied opinions. Another thing that's always uh, a source of further conversation, I won't go in too much, is kind of, this is really also allows you to talk about the complexity of genetics and of traits, right? If we're um, like, this is why these three categories on the right here are presented um, in this study I suppose as kind of more hypothetical. Like we don't yet have the tools to really say, select for, I don't know, the next Usain Bolt, the next Olympic champion sprinting, right? That we're not there yet. These are very complex traits. They're genetically complex, but also complex in the sense of environmental influences, impacting genetics, things like that. So again, this slide can be a whole conversation in itself when it comes to that. And so other ways where we're, like I said, this, this is where the presentation again talks about how genetics lives in society. We give information, for example, about what percent of IVF clinics, and this is US data, test for certain things. Um, just so you kind of have an awareness. This is from 2008, which was the most up-to-date information we had when we updated this lesson in 2019. Um, but it's still, it gives you an idea of like what is actually being done. What are people really testing for? What is allowed? So it's things that stand out for me, for example, is this non-medical sex selection. Um, in most of Europe, so as I'm Dutch myself, in most of Europe, you're not allowed to do non-medical sex selection. So what's meant by that is um, in the United States, it's often referred to as family planning. So this is sex selection based on, for example, you've had three boys and you want a girl. It's not sex selection as, for example, the, the category above where there's like X-linked diseases. So then like, selecting for sex can play a role because it has a medical reason for it. Um, so here actually we do have updated data that by 2018, about 73% of clinics in the US do offer that option. Another thing that's always an interesting conversation point is some clinics offer selection for a disability. So what's meant by that is that you're selecting for something or that you have the opportunity to select an embryo for something that's perceived to be a disability or disorder. So think um, deafness or dwarfism are examples of that. Another way where the technology meets society is how are these technologies going to be regulated, right? So this is um, a study where they asked, again, the US public about how they feel PGD should be regulated. And as you can see from this pie chart, very varied opinions on this from people saying we need a total ban on using this technology to people wanting uh, the government to regulate the safety, the quality, as well as the ethics, to people saying we don't want any government regulation, like it's a wide variety of opinions. And again, really the aim here is to just get that message across um, and have people look beyond their, their own bubbles and their own awareness and see that this topic is, there's a wide variety of opinions, which is why it's so important to have dialogues with a wide variety of people um, about this. And so this is kind of like uh, the final information slide before I go into some more strategies. Um, 
the final information side of the actual lesson that talks about like accessibility um, to these different technologies, like what I alluded to earlier. This again is US specific for those of you here are international. I hope this inspires you to find your own day, but like we're focusing on US here and just talking about the fact that for a lot of states, there are no kind of laws about what insurance should cover when it comes to infertility related treatments. For those states that do have laws, which are listed here, some of them cover IVF, some of them don't. Uh, there can be a lot of exemptions related to that. And so it's really to just take home the point of like, these technologies are very expensive and that means that people need funds to be able to access them, just time to make sense of all the kind of legal insurance questions, stuff like that, um, are all kind of barriers that we need to keep in mind as these technologies meet up with society. And so with that, I wanted to switch, like I said, we're always interested in dialogue. So what are some more strategies or things we use to encourage dialogue and have conversations about these things? So. We saw the kind of discussion question at the start. We did the polling in the middle, which is not a moment where people can interact. And so this is another technique that I'm a huge fan of, which is a four corners activity. And this actually comes from our introduction lesson. So like Marty mentioned, our lessons are not cookie cutter material. You kind of want to adapt them to your own group you're talking with. And we often do that all the time. So this time I'm pulling materials from different lessons to kind of talk about this. We actively, advise people, our teachers that we work with to like, you know, we've made these lessons and you can run them as, as we designed them. Like they have everything uh, hopefully that you need from the information activities, quizzes, but we also 100% encourage you to take out the slides that you feel you wanna maybe mix with whatever you're already talking about and kind of mix and match that way. So today, this is from our introduction lesson, Four Corners activity. The idea is if you're in a physical space and you can adapt this to online is that you would assign the four corners of the room you're in with saying strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And then we would put up a statement. And in this case, I picked one of the statements that's relevant for our lesson on uh, reproduction genetic testing. For example, the statement here would be parents undergoing in vitro fertilization should have the option to screen embryos for variants likely to cause a serious disease. Now, if we were doing this, Activity, we would now ask participants like move to that corner of the room that you kind of feel where your opinion matches, right? Now, what I often like to do is also call out the center of the room or a dedicated space as being a neutral zone. And that can be either because you're kind of in between agree, disagree, so you're kind of neutral, but also a space for people that might feel like, I feel I don't know enough about this, so I want to stand in the middle. Um, like I said, at the very start, I think one of our classroom agreements is like, it's, it's okay to not have an opinion or it's okay to kind of be in the middle. That's something we encourage here. Um, especially with students, they often feel they have to be very strongly for, or very strongly against Like, No, you can be in the middle. These topics are, you know, there's many facets to them and, and there might always be a clear, a clear answer for yourself. And so as we're kind of, you know, we, we present the statement, we ask people to move to whatever corner of the room they feel they uh, they fit with, we then start the conversation of like, why did you choose to step, for example, in the strong we agree? And so this is where, again, those classroom agreements will start coming very handy, right? To help you kind of manage this conversation. If one person is talking a lot, you can refer back to them like, remember at the start, we agreed, you know, to give everybody some space. So thank you for sharing yours, but we'd love to hear from other people in the room. So that's why kind of, these moments, these, these participation, these classroom agreements can be very helpful. And as people are sharing their opinions, we always strongly encourage people like, let's imagine you, you stood in your strongly agree, that's kind of where you were, but you hear people from the disagree side sharing certain opinions. And you're like, oh, actually, that kind of moves me from strongly agree to agree or even towards this degree. We encourage people to move around the room. And this is something we see all the time, like, um, we actually did this very statement or something very similar to this statement. I did it in a classroom in Ohio with children that they were about, I think, 10 or 11 years old. Again, these statements work with huge age ranges. Obviously, you're going to have slightly different conversations, but they're surprisingly effective in, in many, many ages. And so in that classroom, we, we did the statements and the kids moved to their different corners. And we had a girl who was on the agree side saying, I want parents to be able to screen. And she spoke up and she said, well, 
out on a screen because I want to make sure my child doesn't have a disease, right? Which is an opinion you might hear. And then I had a boy who was on the disagree side of the room raise his hand and he said, well, not a lot of people know this, but I have autism. And if people make this widely available, I would not, might not be here today because they would never select me. Boom, right? I mean, that's intense. That's a personal experience. This happens a lot. People in these conversations will share their personal experience. It was very brave of him to speak up. And what happened next? I mean, it always, uh, it's, it's very impressive that the girl actually was on the agree side. She moved towards the neutral side of the room. And she said to, to her classmate, she was like, well, first of all, thank you for sharing. That was very brave of you to just tell us that. And she was like, I would not want that these technologies now mean that you wouldn't be my classmate, right? That that could have meant that you would have never been here. And so I just wanted to raise an example as kind of showing how these play out, but also like these can be very powerful to kind of get people involved, share their personal experiences and really get conversations going of where genetics meets people's lives. And so got a couple of minutes here. Another technique or another kind of strategy that we use a lot in our lesson is something called case studies, or if you're looking at our lessons, they might be called scenarios. And the aim here is really to kind of describe scenarios, generally a couple of paragraphs of kind of real life common experiences of genetics coming into people's lives where we ask students or our participants to kind of step into the shoes of somebody in that scenario. So step in somebody else's shoes and think how uh, these things might influence you. And I'll get to some examples soon. And we really aim in a lot of these scenarios to, to look at these cases from different angles. Um, so for example, this scenario, it's titled, A Family Weighs Its Options to Help a Sick Child. This is actually from our reproductive genetic testing lesson. And it's a scenario that basically is the, the Nash family story that I talked about earlier. And so example questions, I just highlight a couple of the questions here are, what would you do as a parent if you were in this situation and why? So we're now asking people like step into the parent's shoes and think about um, your thoughts and, and how you would act. And then the second question is how could this impact how each child sees their role in the family? So in a way we're asking them like, no, step in the, in the shoes of Molly, right? Who, was cured of or found treatment for her for Fanconi anemia or step into Adam's shoes who might at some point in his life learn that he was as an embryo selected because he could help his sister. How would you feel about that? How would the relationship between you and your sibling be? It's really to kind of, again, give people a chance to step in different people's shoes that are not their own. Think about how different people might react to different things and, and widen your kind of, uh, your views on how these technologies live in society. Another example is this one, if family decides where to have a baby, what is traditionally thought of as a genetic disorder or disability. All right, so here we're again thinking about, for example, some people might want to, and these are, there's news stories out there if you're interested, um, you can Google for them. I think it was a UK story where a, a couple to deaf parents wanted to select for a child with deafness and weren't allowed to do that because in the UK, in the way that was regulated, deafness was linked, labeled as a disability and therefore you couldn't select for it. And so we have some questions with that scenario, very similar to the previous one where we asked like, imagine you're the parents or imagine you're that child that eventually gets born. But another question that I've highlighted here is like, comes from it from an, another angle is like, who do you think should decide how PG or how PGD, sorry, is used, right? Is it parents, doctors, lawmakers? religious leaders, um, and so on. So it's kind of more, again, going towards the regulation part. And a final example, um, this is actually from our les lesson on genome editing and CRISPR, where we talk about, so again, how you can mix and, match, mix and match lessons, we talk about germline editing. So it kind of links to this topic. And so here we set the scenario up a, a little different, which is like we ask people to, um, imagine that they're an elected official and they need to make a recommendation on something, right? So they, uh, we ask students to read the topic, which is kind of explains like, what do, you, what do you expect to make a decision on? And then we ask people like, what else do you need to know to make this informed decision? And who should you ask? So here we're kind of switching the setup a bit to where we ask like, okay, you've been given this much information, you're asked to make this decision 
what are other questions? What is more information you want to know? So it's like a, a practice in information searching or at least formulating the questions. And then the second one, who should you ask is really to get to the point of like, this idea of like how varied voices and having voices from all different types of communities together is important, right? If we think, for example, the previous topic of like, should PGD be used um, or can it be used when people want to select for deafness, who would you want to ask? Well, you might want to for sure ask a geneticist, but you might also want to ask a physician, the deaf community, psychologists. There's many people you probably want to hear from before making those type of decisions. And so, oh yeah, these are just the two scenarios in the genome editing lesson that get to that. So one of the topics is, is it, accessible, is it acceptable to edit the genome of human embryos to treat genetic diseases? And is the use of genome editing for non-medical enhancement acceptable or not? So these are just to give you a flavor of the different topics that we look at. And so with that, I've talked a lot about <laughs> different things. Um, so I wanted to just acknowledge the fact that a lot of these strategies, Four Corners being one of them, but like the discussions at the start, the polling that we luckily were able to do interactive, but also this really to get a feel for it, to experience it and to you know, um, do these kind of activities yourself. The best way to do it is by, like I said, experiencing and doing it yourself. Um, and so when it comes to kind of next steps for for, for us in this series, uh, there's gonna be, there are more webinars scheduled and I highly encourage you to join us for those. But the one thing I wanted to also kind of highlight is that we are planning smaller interactive workshops to really go into a lot of these things in a lot more depth than a webinar setup allows us to do and to really kind of, like it says, interactively go through a lot of these techniques and strategies and practice them going forward. Then before I move on to Q&A, because I'm sure there's people with questions and I'd love to hear from everybody, I have two announcements that I'm very excited about. Well, the first one I'm definitely very excited about, which is that we started a Slack workshop, which the link to will hopefully be shared in chat as I'm talking. And the aim here is to really create a community, create a space where we can meet each other, everybody who's interested, clearly you're here today, interested in kind of public engagement around different topics. Um, it's A, to kind of continue the conversation from today, but definitely it's for us to have conversations about everything inclusive public in, about inclusive public engagement but for also for participants here to meet each other i'm sure there's a lot of you here who are doing engagement things and it would be wonderful if we can create these connections and really get things moving so i really hope you'll join us on slack um, for those of you who are new on Slack, there is a channel that's called welcome i highly encourage you to start there there is a guide there on on some tips and tricks on how to use slack so hopefully that will be helpful and feel free always to reach out to us, but I hope to see you there. My second announcement is that there will also be a link shared in chat to a survey for to get your feedback on this webinar, on our webinars in general, which will be super helpful for us as we're thinking about the next webinars, as we're thinking about how we're gonna structure these workshops for you. It's super helpful to hear about your ideas and your thoughts on these things. And so with that, I'm gonna stop presenting and talking so much. I'm going to ask um, Jessica to stop the recording here um, so that we can move on to discussion Q&A.